And so to our feature guest, who's returning to counting the costs this week, Roger Bootle. He's the Managing Director of Capital Economics in London. We've spoken in the past about his book, uh, The Trouble with Europe, which is now getting a paperback run, I believe, Roger. Nice to see you. I'm going to start with a word which I really don't like, but, you know, it's been coined and it's out there, Brexit. So let's use it once and, and ask you, as a man who knows about Europe, how real is the possibility of this so-called British exit? Oh, I think it's a real possibility. I don't think myself it's the most likely outcome. Uh, David Cameron's a very skilled negotiator and politician, as we've just seen in the latest UK election, not to be underestimated. Uh, there is actually, hidden beneath the surface, quite a lot of support on the continent for the idea that uh, the EU does need reforming. I think the real problem he's got is that the degree of reform really radical stuff that's going to be necessary to satisfy the Eurosceptics in his own party and to deflect the challenge from UKIP, which is still there, the UK Independence Party. That sort of degree of change really needs uh, treaty change, mm. change to the treaties of the EU. And that's what the leaders of the EU think they're not prepared to give. But you, you could argue that whether the UK uh, leaves the EU or not, uh, in two years' time, that means we're looking at at least two years of, of uncertainty. I would think if I was a, a, a business owner in the UK who, who did a lot of trade with European countries, I'd be worried right now. I'm striking deals and doing business with Europe without knowing what the future is going to be. Yeah, there's something in that argument, but I think, frankly, not a lot. Uh, it's quite clear that if Britain were to leave the EU, frankly, nearly everything would carry on exactly the same as before. We currently do a lot of our trade with the rest of Europe. We carry on doing a lot of our trade with the rest of Europe. Whether or not there was some sort of free trade agreement, I think the most likely thing is actually if Britain did leave the EU, then we would have some sort of special trade deal, which would mean that all those businesses in Britain that have very close links and ties with Europe would be left largely unaffected. Now, it's possible it wouldn't be quite like that, but even if we didn't have a special deal, uh, we would continue doing a huge proportion of our trade with what is now the EU. Yeah, of course, logic would dictate that because Europe isn't going anywhere and it would remain the closest trading area. But, Roger, there are a lot of numbers out there uh, which talk about potential losses if more trade barriers go up. £50 billion a year is one figure. Apparently the UK could, could lose that much in a worst-case scenario uh, if these trade barriers do go up. I mean, it, it, it will make life somewhat more difficult, won't it? Well, possibly a bit more difficult. Numbers, numbers, numbers. The world's full of people who profess to be experts mm. pulling numbers out of the air. You've got to be careful with numbers. I mean, I've looked at this issue very closely, and in my book, I do, I think, give a pretty fair account of the range of estimates that has come out. You get on the other side of the account, by the way, some pretty hefty estimates of the gains to Britain from coming out of the EU. I think those are extreme as well. In the end, there won't be, I think, a great deal of difference. Does the Scotland factor play into this at all, Roger? The fact that we could be looking at a breakup of the Euro of the United Kingdom at the same time or, 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 or before an EU exit? Yeah, I think this is a very tricky issue indeed. Uh, clearly, the UK is in, in peril, I think, because of the strength of nationalism in Scotland. However, one shouldn't overreact, I think, to this election result. The SNP, the Scottish Nationalist Party, swept the board in Scotland, winning, I think it's 56 out of 59 seats. But if you look at the share of votes, actually it only won half the votes in Scotland. Mm -hmm. At the general election before this one, as many people in Scotland voted, not Labour, voted Conservative as voted for the Scottish National Party. And, of course, in the referendum last September, uh, the SNP's call for independence, uh, that was lost quite comprehensively. Roger, let's start widening things out uh, a little bit to the rest of Europe. I mentioned Brexit before, which of course derived its name from Grexit, the idea of a Greek exit. Uh, is that still a possibility? You know, whilst we sort of switch our focus like this, is the idea of that Greek exit still sort of bubbling on? I mean, arguably it's been bubbling on for, for many years now. Yes, of course, the word Grexit uh, usually refers to Greek exit from the Euro rather than from the EU, of whereas course. Brexit, Britain not being in the Euro, of course, mm. is about Britain's exit from the EU. Yes, I think Brexit is very much still a risk. 
In fact, more than that, I think it's become a lot more likely than it seemed even a few years ago. And I think what happens then is time, time is what really causes these issues to play out. Mm. During the last several years, austerity has been pursued, there's been time for Greece to get over this, time for the European leaders to moderate, time for the Greek government to be a bit more emollient, and all that time has brought, in fact, no progress on these things at all. The Greek position is really desperate. And I think we're running out of time now. I think we're running uh, towards the point at which one side or the other is going to say enough. OK, final thought from you then, Roger, on the current direction that Europe is taking. I'm specifically referring to the idea of quantitative easing, the move that was finally brought in by the ECB. In your opinion, has it had an impact? Uh, if not, will it have an impact? Well, I've always taken a non-extreme position on quantitative easing. I'm surrounded by economists who, on the one hand, some of them seem to think it's the answer to a maiden's prayer. You just uh, press the button, pour all this money into the system and everything comes right. And on the other hand, people who think that uh, quantitative easing is the work of the devil. Hmm. Uh, I, I think in monetary conditions that exist today, that's to say where the financial system, the banks, are not broken but very, very severely damaged, I don't think QE is actually that effective. Okay. Now, in um, the Eurozone, they didn't have an awful lot of room for manoeuvre, didn't have that many policy instruments to put into play once interest rates had come very low. So I think it's been the right thing to introduce quantitative easing, but you shouldn't expect too much of it. Now, what's happened so far is that there has been a revival in the Eurozone economy. It's currently looking a bit stronger, actually, in the first quarter than either the US or the UK. And that's being associated with QE. I doubt myself, actually, whether QE has got that much to do with it. A bit, perhaps, via the lower exchange rate for the euro. I think that the re re revival in the eurozone is more to do with lower oil prices. As we go forward, though, with the central bank pumping in some more money, yes, I think on balance that's going to help a bit. But can that be expected to cure the eurozone's fundamental problems? No. Roger Bertle with his thoughts on the trouble with Europe. Great talking to you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.